Okay, we're going to continue our lesson from last time, talk a little bit more about exception handling. Uh, last time I left you, we had discussed how we could use a simple try-catch block to anticipate errors and intercept them. So instead of the operating system handling the error, we would handle the error in the code ourselves. I want to show you a extended concept here. I, I mentioned to you also last time we were together, instead of having just one try and one catch, we could have this situation where we have one try, you know, like one pitcher who's throwing the ball, and multiple catchers. And I haven't shown you that yet, but I'm going to show you that now. And you might be wondering, why would we want that? Uh, but let me just show you to make a sense when we give you an example. So let's say that in addition to having this catch block, I could also have another catch block here like this. Okay, so now you can see I have a single try. I'm doing this business where I'm reading the number. And then I have this exception that happens if they type in garbage. Then I have this other exception, which we'll talk about in a minute. And you can see that I'm taking a harsher line here. I'm giving a different error message, and this time I'm shutting the program down. Here I kind of assumed that they wanted a one and moved on. Here I've shut the entire program down. What do you think is happening here? Why do we have multiple exceptions? What's the concept? What's the concept here? Okay, Mr. Garofalo, sir. So you were here when we did the input mismatch exception. What do you think is going on over here? Exactly. That's if it's like any weird thing happens that you're not expecting. Okay. Whenever there's a user involved, they do weird stuff and you just can't anticipate it all. So here, if they typically type in garbage, you can handle this. This is where if some other thing happens, what? We don't know. So um, I'm not sure I can demo this for you, but try to understand that if, if something happens and it doesn't fall into this category, this is like a catch all category. If something bad happens and, and it doesn't fit this, it'll fit that. And so this is an, a good example of a try-catch block where you have specific things that you're expecting, and then here is the really unexpected. You don't know what might go wrong, but you're just not taking any chances. So this will run fine. Now, I'm going to show you something, and this is the crux of today's lesson. This is the, the core of the lesson. Ready? Watch. I'm going to move this catch block now to up here, and I want you to see what happens when I compile it. Look, it doesn't compile. And I want you to discuss with your partner why it doesn't compile. When I put my cursor under the red markings, what's the cur what's the compiler going to complain about? That's my question. What is the issue? What does it not like here? So what, you, what I think what Ms. Sophie is saying, and rightly so, is that this code is unreachable because it's going to first check to see if it's any kind of exception. And that's like a superset of this thing. This covers everything. So you'll never get here. So you can see here that it says the exception's already been caught, so this code's never gonna run. So therefore, an important principle, and my only real big part of the lesson today, is that if you have multiple catches, you need to put them from most specific to least specific. Does that make sense? The other way of looking at this is that this exception here is, it inherits from this exception there. So it's a subclass. This is like the parent class. This is like the subclass. So when you declare the catches, you have to declare the ones in the lowest part of the inheritance hierarchy first, and then move on to the more, more general there. So this has to come before that. Usually we, we have one of these catch-alls. We always just put it at the end and that's the end of it. Okay, so that's half of my lesson for today.